Chile Farms in Ecuador, welcome back to the channel. I'm here today with my good friend Santiago. Santi, thanks for being here, buddy. My pleasure. So today is going to be the Ecuador Q&A. These are questions that everyone has sent in, and uh, we're going to do our best to answer them the best of our ability anyway, and we'll see what happens. So, okay, so we're going to get into this first one, and some of these are a little in-depth, and I hope you'll stick through for the entire answer because uh, it's good information. Um, this one came in, it says, uh, Ren and Vilcabamba is apparently 250 to 700 a month for a two bedroom, but houses are 100,000 or more, usually a lot more. You can earn eight plus percent on your money in the bank in Ecuador. So if you put the money in a bank, you would come out way ahead financially if you just rent. Are places just much less expensive once you're on the ground in Ecuador versus what is advertised online? Or what is the reason for renting being so inexpensive versus buying? So, um, yes. <laughs> yeah, you can. So, And I'm going to use 150000 as an example because I think that's a good place to start. So if I put 150000 in a CD here at 8%, and, and let me just say CDs, you know, used to pay more. We used to see a lot of 9.5%, 10%. Even my JEP one is down to 8% now. Um, if you see above 12%, you probably don't want to do business there. <laughs> They're true. going out of business. Yes. But 75 to 8% is pretty average. So at 8%, um, 150000 in the CD is going to give you 12000 annually or, you know, $1,000 a month in income. So um, if you wanted to build a house and rent it out, had $1,000 a month, if you could get that, depending on where it was and, you know, what kind of house it was, if you could get that much for it, um, it'd take you 150 months or 12 and a half years if it was 100% occupied during that whole time. So, y you know, yeah, it's better to leave your money in the CD and rent, definitely. And the reason you would want to build a house or buy a house is because you might be like us, you like to homestead, you like having your own gardens. You don't want anybody real close to you. You don't want a landlord. Some people just don't like having a landlord. I like the freedom of having my own place. That's just me. And Santi, you, you have a rule that you were talking about when looking at investment. Correct. But that's from the point of view, if you want to do an investment in a house to, to rent. So I call it the 1% rule or the 10-10. So it's basically, let's say you buy a house for you're looking to buy a house for 150, we're using 150,000 now. So let's use as an example, 150,000, 10 months rented per year, not 12, just 10. So 10 months occupancy out of 12. Let's just say that and 10, on 10 years. For 10 years. So that means you need to rent at least a house that you're looking for, you're looking at uh, 1,500. If you can't rent that because of the market or not bedrooms enough or the ubication is not good. So if you cannot rent a house for $1,500 a month, then it makes no sense to buy the house as an investment. As an investment, yeah. Correct. So, yeah, and I'll just say $1,500 a month is the upper end. That is the top here. There may be some place at 2000 but they are. are. They are yeah. some rentals for two thousand dollars. Yeah, that's the very upper end of the in market. In Vilcamba, right? Thousand and less is where most of the activity happens. So yes, yes. So um, maybe you're not interested in the investment. Maybe you just want to have your investment in CDs, uh, something more liquid like that, and you just want to rent. That's great. Um, just understand, landlords here are not maybe going to put in all the conveniences that you're used to. Um, and some of the security that we talk about as well, you know, the security bars and different right. things that you might need, that would have to come out of your pocket. Most landlords here are not going to help you with that. True. So there's reasons for buying, um, you know, both ways. It just depends on who you are. So, right. yeah, I think you do see, um, you know, some houses that are priced extremely high here online that actually sell for a lot more. And, and I have another question here that asks that. 
So I'll get into that a little bit more on the on the other question um, about what's the true selling price here. It's it's hard because we don't really have like an MLS, a multiple listing service that that lists not only the asking price but what the house actually sold for. Um, so in tax records here are not available like that. So it's different. Okay, I'm gonna move on to the next question. How does the cost of building greenhouses in Ecuador uh, compare to the cost of building them in Texas? Well, that's an apples and oranges question because they don't build greenhouses here like they do in Texas and other places. Um, first of all, in the US, we have to build them for snow load. Even though parts of Texas don't normally get snow, we get really high winds. And so we build them a lot more uh, sturdy. Let me just say that. And, and they just build them differently here. Uh, the labor here is gonna be a whole lot cheaper than it would in the US. So that lowers the price of the greenhouse. Your plastic um, and your uh, screen for the size, pricing is gonna be about the same. So yeah, um, you know, I built my greenhouses here. We built them ourselves. I, you know, I got maybe 600 in one of them. The other one I have closer to $1,000. They're not huge greenhouses. Um, they're maybe, uh, I think five meters by 10 meters, something like that, not, not real big. Um, so yeah, I, you know, because the labor is so cheap, it was much easier to build. What did it take longer here to build a greenhouse versus the States? No, I, I think it probably take longer in the States. And one of the reasons is we build so much bigger ones in the States. Okay. You know, they're huge. I mean, 100, 120 feet long minimum in the States. Um, these greenhouses are much smaller. There are some parts of Ecuador that build some pretty big greenhouses. Over in Cerro Gordo, I see some pretty big ones there, down at the coast maybe. Um, but most of them are smaller like ours, yeah. I think, um, let me go back to the first question again. We were talking about investing in properties and uh, you know whether you should put your money in a CD. So I built our little casita here, I had it built. Um, the casita itself cost 23,000 to build and that's finished, ready to move into doesn't include the land. So I started out renting that at, at $350 per month. I, I'm now renting it at $400 a month. But if you just say you rent it at $400 a month, 100% of the time, it would take almost five years to recoup my money out of that. So that's not taking into account repairs, um, repainting, you know, those kind of things, the labor in that. And it's not taking into account the price of the land. So all total, 30,000, let's say, um, including the land that it sits on. So what would you say? We've got to have 300 a month. Yeah, of your 1010 rule. Yep. Got to have 300 a month for at least 10 months of the year. If you're above uh, the 300. If... So I'm above 300. So then you're yeah. fine. So I got a good investment Makes sense. there. Makes Absolutely. Get my money back in, you know, five to six years. So, Perfect. Yeah. And you I didn't. You can do it under the 10 years. Great. Yeah, I'm in good shape. So the the one thing we're also not mentioning is the value that that building added to my property. Um, we won't know what that is until we sell someday. And who knows, I may be dead when that happens. But, uh, you know, um, it does add value and it does bring value to the overall yeah. piece of property. Yeah, I was going to say, let's uh, hope not. <laughs> <laughs> we all got to go. None of us make it out of here alive, man. Nobody makes it out alive. All, All right. right. So I got a, a question from somebody named Carson. It says, um, basically, since crime seems to be downplayed in most of the considered safer locations, specifically the gated communities in the mountains of Vilcabamba, why is a very common theme when viewing videos from other expats there, and occasionally yours, always mention said security measures, uh, et cetera? Should we assume that crime then is minimalized only while at home and you are at greater risk in town when grocery shopping or eating out, only to be considered relatively safe due to the number of police or security guards? Or is it more to do with the severity of punishment when caught in the commission of a crime is harsh enough that it contributes to reduce crime? Uh, let, me, let me start out by saying the laws here are so much different than what we're used to in North America 
that I don't view the law as much of a deterrent to crime here. Do you? Um, you know, you can get away with murder here and be out in seven years. Um, yeah. We know somebody True. got out in five years. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, some people actually make it out the country before their trial starts. Yeah, they leave the country. Actually, if, if you mess around with drugs, it's worse than killing somebody here. Yes, they're really tough on, on uh, drug smuggling and Absolutely. money laundering. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so let me say that to start out with. Now, I, I know that there's some YouTubers that play down the crime here because they have some vested interest in getting you here. We have zero vested. You want to move here, wonderful. If you don't, okay. You know, we're, we're not trying to encourage, discourage. I get, I do get accused of being too soft about it. And then I turn around, somebody else has accused me of dissuading people from moving here by talking about it. I'm not trying to do either. I'm just trying to make you aware, as best we know, the situation. So, and, and that always changes from day to day. Um, we feel perfectly safe where we live, but we have all this security in place, you know? That's why we feel safe. We, yes, we have the dogs. Yes, we have all the stuff. So, um, there, there is still some, some burglaries happening here, just like they would anywhere in the world. Um, somebody got robbed the other day. They went to Loja and came home and somebody had ransacked their house, took all their electronics. So um, don't move here if you think losing all your electronics, you're not going to be able to afford to re replace those because that could happen, especially if you're in a rental that's not secure. I have two quick tips actually uh, really security right now. Number one is um, <clears throat> when you're buying a property or you do an investment or you're moving money, or you're buying whatever, whatever you do, don't tell anybody, okay? I know people in, in restaurants, in their group are talking about because they are proud, I'm buying a new car, I'm, I'm buying this house. It's, it's fine, but somebody else may is, is maybe hearing it listening to it and yeah and once the information gets to the wrong person you're a target then yeah so you gotta be very careful who 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 and where you talk keep your private them. stuff private Absolutely. and that's why i get questions all the time on our youtube channel people want to know the ins and outs of my security here i'm not going to tell you <laughs> You know, Correct. especially so, not, you know, on YouTube, um, just not happen. So. Uh, we always, you know, in many of our videos, we, we list a lot of things that you should do. But, you know, if you want to, in any detail, you got to come here and visit and talk to Santi and I in private. And we'll tell you what we would do. And we'll tell you whether a particular area we think is more dangerous than another. Um, obviously, Waikil is not a great place to move to right now. Uh, there's a lot of problems there. I would not live in that big city. And there are parts of Quito I certainly would not live in. Um, they're very True. dangerous. True. I do think we're safer here in the small mountain town that we're in uh, than those bigger cities. But it doesn't mean it's 100% completely safe. Correct. Correct. My second tip would be um, if you always use the same or pick up two taxi drivers you don't if you don't own a car if you don't drive a car your own car always use the same maximum two taxi drivers yeah that's a that's a that's a big alert to use different taxi drivers i wouldn't do that and tell those taxi drivers if you're not available don't send someone else exactly because because they will do that they'll say well i'm going to send my friend you know and just say nope yeah, if he's not available, then call the other one. Yeah, that's, that, that's you it. need to. And and it's not just two that guys that you, you trust, but then it's only two people that have to be questioned later if something goes wrong. And um, and then you can keep an accounting of who's been to your property, who hasn't. And Correct. It's, it works better, I, I believe. I say that a lot in our videos, so please believe us when we tell you, you know, like in our property, we only allow to, if you rent here from us and you start trying to call someone else to come up, we're going to ask you to rent somewhere else. We're going to ask you to leave. True. You, that's a rule here you cannot break with us. Yes, I, I know some uh, places where you have to use 
this taxi driver and this one and another one. Absolutely. Now, I don't make a nickel on what taxi you use. This is strictly about our safety here. So are we safer in town? I, I never feel uncomfortable or unsafe in town at all. Um, you know, we eat in town. Uh, there's only two police officers in Bilcabamba, maybe a third new captain or something. Um, and then the national police will come in sometimes. Uh, but they're not here every day. So there's, the police presence is almost not worth talking about. Um, I will say that um, there are certain places in Loja that I'm probably a little more careful. You know, I watch my my bags and things. I don't set my cell phone on the on the table while I'm talking with Absolutely. people. You know, never had an incident, but I'm careful. I'm gosh, I was careful in the U.S. So I, I would say that um, yeah, it's it's at home where your personal belongings are. That's what's most vulnerable. They want to come in here and they want electronics. They want cash. You know, anything they can get their hands on. Um, and so um, it happens. It, it it's not it's a little more frequent in the last year, but but we're back to kind of being a little more quiet right now in the last few weeks. Uh, there have been a couple little things happen, but we don't always get the full story. We always don't always get the correct story. So we we try to relate it to you as best we can. Um, but you just have to visit here, and you have to see who. Talk to people on the street. Hey, how do you feel about living here? Are you comfortable? Or, or are you scared? Um, I'm not going to live anywhere that I'm, I'm scared all the time. Um, I just won't do it. Okay, enough said about that. Um, <clears throat> there was some questions about our dogs and our fence and stuff. And no, I'm not going to get into that. Just yes, you should have it all. Um, Oh, this is a good one. The other question uh, this gentleman had was, uh, for allowed more than one topic, why is it when Google, when you Google, there is such mass confusion and simply complete contradictory opinions on the safeness of the drinking water, even if it's in the mountains, which is supposedly the safest source there is? I, I will say this. We get our water from the Podocarpus Park. The big river runs up there through the park, high in the mountains. Really good water. I still filter it. Now, our water comes direct over from the storage tanks up there. The water that goes down to Vilcabamba is treated at the treatment plant and then dished out. And so there's possibly chlorine or chloramine. No. I'm not sure. No? They don't, I'm on the same system as you are. They do not use chlorine. They do not use chlorine. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we don't have it in our water here. And when they clean the filters, they use some chlorine. And then you can smell it for about a day. And then it goes away. In town, they do use uh, in town they do in use chlorine. A separate system. So we have a few systems in Vilcamba here. Yeah. So I had a German guy come up here and visit, and he had an EC meter, and he's testing water everywhere. He tested our water. He says this is the best water I found anywhere, anywhere. And uh, he's in the business of doing that. So I, I'm assuming he knew what he was talking about. Um, and you were mentioning a while ago about uh, why you might want to take precautions if you get water from the river. Yeah, well, I do drink water from uh, straight from the tap. And that water comes from uh, about six kilometers from the Polycarpus. It is actually one of the best waters in, in the world. Actually. In the world. Absolutely. Yeah. But you can't control if, uh, for example, you have some animals in the river and then you Livestock, have some... Livestock, yeah. Yeah. You, you know what they're going to do when they're in possible. the river. <laughs> yeah, I mean, animals yes. will be animals. So um, I, ha I have had, had some couple of friends that drink for the first time the water and they get a little bit sick, but just one time. So I guess you have some microbes in the water. Yeah, you're going to have some yes, microbes that aren't not. quite right. But um, I will keep drinking from the tap straight. Yeah. It's it's good water. It's good water. And there are places here where I would have no problem going to a stream or a spring and drinking right out of it. I mean, I have done it. You can, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Possible. And it's that good. In the cities, in particular, Cuenca, oh, man, their water smells terrible. 
It's, it's got a lot of chlorine in it. I don't drink the tap water there. When I go to Cuenca, I get a bottle of water. Yeah, you may not like plastics, and and I don't either, but, um, or, you know, use one of your own little filtration bottles or something. Um, I do the same. When I'm in Cuenca or travel to other um, cities, I always take my own water. Yeah, the coast is kind of known for having problems with water over at the coast. You know, the earthquake that happened over there years ago really was tough on the water systems. Um, you can get some bad water on the coast real quick. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Do not drink that tap water. Don't drink the tap water. Filter it, do something, a Berkey water filter or something. In that case, just go to the shop and buy water from the shop and bottled water. Yeah. Get it from a tienda. So I will say that all of you from North America in particular, but other countries too, when you move here, it's going to take about six months for your stomach to get used to the bacteria here. Um, there's just different bacteria in the food. And so it's going to take six months for your stomach to build up the right bacteria. I have problems with my stomach all the time. And many of you know I've been sick. It's not from that. Mine's from diverticulitis, which I've had for almost 30 years now, actually 30 years. So, um, so that's not why I get sick. I do have to be very, very careful with the food in town um, because it will irritate and activate my diverticulitis. But it doesn't mean that you're going to have the problems that I have. Um, most people here, I mean, I did fine my first couple of years here in Ecuador. I was sick a couple of times the first six months. And then I was eating better than I ever had in the U.S. I was eating all kinds of stuff. And all of a sudden, my diverticulitis flared up, and I've had a problem for a while and about to get it under control. Yeah. <clears throat> but even me, when I go to a new restaurant, and let's say I'm in Loja or another city, and I go to a new restaurant, and I can get sick. Yeah. Not really sick, but just my body getting used to a new microbe yeah yeah new little or bacteria, bacteria yeah. yeah from this restaurant that restaurant it's possible happens yep it will so yeah that's the answer on the water i mean i know you get a lot of differing opinions but it depends on what part of the country you're in in the city not in the city we have great water where we're at wonderful water um, matter of fact i don't know why you wouldn't drink the water where i am it's better for you Okay, so Kathy uh, has a question. She says, question on flowers. Can you buy bulbs at the local nursery? Do canna, dahlias, or um, irises grow there? Do you know the cost of bulbs or rhizomes? <clears throat> so, yeah, absolutely. I've got a property full of canna lilies. I've got spider lilies. I've got Easter lilies. I've got irises everywhere. I've got, uh, you, you name it, all kind of rhizomes. So I give away thousands and thousands of can of bulbs. So if you want can of bulbs, come see me. You can have all you want. I, I've got friends that have absolutely populated their properties with it. They grow so well here, you have to thin them out a couple times a year. Um, you'll see some of them in the nurseries in pots uh, growing that way. And um, yeah, so there, a lot of that's available here. There may be some specific ones that aren't, um, you know, some special variety. Uh, but there's ways of getting that stuff here. And uh, once you get to know some people here, become part of some of the local gardening clubs, you'll figure that out real quick. So um, do homeowners mow the yards or just weed whack? So yeah, we use weed whackers a lot here. Lawn mowers are available at, at Kiwi. It's like a Home Depot in Loja. You can buy a lawn mower there. I don't know anybody who owns one. We had a real type mower. We sold it. Um, I, I, I'm not a big grass kind of guy. The only kind of grass I want in place is something that's either holding soil in place or is going to become animal feed. Um, so that your peanut grasses and things like that. And um, But there are people, you know, like in San Joaquin, you know, the gated subdivisions who do have lawns. Uh, but, but mostly it's weed whackers. Uh, but if you want a lawnmower, by all means, you can get an electric one or a gas one at Kiwi, I noticed. They've got them both, so... Have at it. Um, again, I, you know, that's kind of a North American idea. That's not something that people do here a lot. But, you know, if that's what you want, you can do it. All right. Kathy also asked on the topic of housing. We looked at a couple while in Vilcabamba. 
Unfortunately for us, the one we love sold. But as I watch the internet for the homes for sale, sometimes they drop in price, 20, 40, $100,000. Not sure what price range to look in, look at higher price property and negotiate to get in the range we want to pay. Um, so yeah, uh, you will see properties here that are, that you may notice and look to be overpriced and they are. <laughs> um, some are, without a doubt. They're asking way too much. And the idea is, you know, some dummy who's got a lot of money is going to come along and pay it. Could happen, does happen. Um, people who overpay here are causing problems. And it's not good. The Ecuadorians don't appreciate it because it's now pricing houses and land out of the reach of the average Ecuadorian. Please don't do that. Make sure you get with somebody like Santiago uh, or Nick and, and learn what the prices really should be. And, and they'll tell you if they think something's overpriced. People will sometimes overprice their land because they owe too much at the bank, yeah? Correct. Yeah. yeah. But talking about drops, price going down, it's possible that somebody is selling a property and the bank, for example, is behind them and they really, really have to sell it. So the, the real value can be, let's say, $100,000, but because the bank is coming after them, they are not paying their loan or whatever. Uh, the, loan, the, the bank is going to take their, their land. So to drop their price under the market value, it happens all the time, yeah. It does, and I mean, there's a lot of things behind the scenes that can be going on. Bank's about to repossess, so they'll lower the price in a fire sale, we call it. Um, there are times when someone not only owes the bank, but they also borrowed some money from somebody else. Um, uh, you know, and that's, th there's two lien holders on the land. Correct. So that makes the price higher than what maybe it really should be. So that can happen too. I think, I think you really gotta do your investigating and yes, definitely, if it looks like it's priced too high, don't feel bad about offering less. The worst they can say is, no, thank you. Um, you know, Correct. They're not going to eat you. <laughs> okay, so um, <clears throat> this person also asked, with no young children, is there a good way for new or older expats to meet new people? Any meetups, group gatherings in Vilcabamba or Malacatos? Absolutely. I mean, we're doing something social all the time. There are hiking groups, there's the Domino Club, there's you know, the archery place, uh, we videoed that. Yes. There are people meeting for all sorts of things. Yeah, but let's say more in Vilcamba than in Malacatos. I would say yes, there's not Absolutely. that many expats in Malacatos, there's a few. Um, yeah, we all meet for breakfast Saturday morning you know, at Bamboo Restaurant. Um, you know, we usually meet with at least six people there. And so there's a lot of things available, I think that uh, you know, the pyramid at, Vilco, at uh, Mondongo, the pyramid, they go up there and do all these things, groups of people up there. Um, yeah, there's all kinds of crazy stuff going on here. Correct. There, there's a bridge club. There's um, all, all kinds of stuff. And people get together, like there's a women's group that gets together once a week for lunch, and there's a men's group. Yeah. You know, I used to be part of the men's group. And uh, so uh, they... On, they meet on Wednesdays and then they meet on Sunday for a private group. And we call it the food tour because that's all they do all day long. They go and eat. Yes. You know? And if you are planning to buy in Malacatos, to live in Malacatos, and you want to belong to a group in Vilcamba, no problem. Malacatos is really close to Vilcamba. Yeah, 15 minutes tops. Yeah, yeah it depends where you are in Malacatos. Yeah. You can be 10 minutes away or you can be 20 minutes away. But it's not far. It's not far. Not far at all. And there is, um, uh, there are people who come here who are single and who do date here. Um, that does happen. Uh, your odds are probably going to be better in like Cuenca because there's, you know, 20,000 expats in Cuenca or so. But, but they do that here. Um, I, I say be careful, <laughs> you know, be careful who you date. Make sure you get to know them. And, uh, but yeah, that, that does go on here. Um, okay. <clears throat> Somebody says, Fort Worth Texan says we've, Lisa and I have lived in Ecuador for five plus years. What are the biggest reasons for expats leaving Ecuador? Okay, uh, let me go through this. Number one, grandchildren back home. And they just can't bear to be without the grandchildren. Family, yep. Yeah, family's a, a big, big one. one. Family member back home needs taken care of. Um, that happens. 
people here get sick and their family back home wants them to move home and be and let them take care of them. That happens. Divorce. Um, I always say, don't move here if you're having marital problems. Get your marital problems ironed out before moving to Ecuador. Ecuador is not going to make them better. Correct. Another thing I think that people come here and um, just aren't willing to accept the different culture. Uh, they just they just never really try to fit in culture this culture. Shock. <laughs> it's too much culture yes. shock. Also, I know people that left because they couldn't um, get their uh, visa. That's right. Didn't meet the requirements one way or another. Um, sometimes it's a background check. If you've got some felonies in your background, yeah, you're probably not going to get a visa. You need to ask Isabel about that. Correct. She'll tell you what's, you know, workable and what's not. Um, some people don't have the money to do a, a, an investor visa, uh, either land or CD or something like that. They don't qualify for a student visa. You know, any of those things can keep you from getting a visa. Okay, let's see. Um, here's one from Dan. Is it, uh, oh wait, let's go back. Kathy had another question. Is there a home security company like ADT in the U.S. Um, that if a home alarm triggers, the police dispatch to your home, you know, they, they call your home? So, yes, but um, it would take police an hour just to find my house. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't expect yep. any great response. Um, maybe in Loja, you might get a little bit better response. Um, Santiago's brother, Jose, sells uh, security systems True. and he installs them. And yeah, you can have them somewhat monitored, I guess is what they call it. Yep. You have panic buttons, lights, um, alarm systems. You have everything. You can have everything. Sensors. Um, yeah, you, you can have everything installed. Yeah, you can get all that here. The be better thing to do is have really good neighbors that you're good friends with and good friends that right. will come to your aid in a heartbeat. Um, we know a guy and his wife, and she hid in the closet and typed on her tablet. And I mean, the police, all the neighbors, everybody was there in a matter of minutes. So that That's really did true. help. Absolutely. But yeah, if you want to, if you want to be close to the police, then you need to live in town, right in That's town. That's right. If you live outside, the police will, it will take them to get to your place. Half an hour, one hour. That's a long time. So. If you say, no, I, they already came once to me and they know where, where we live. Next time, maybe there are other guys. They always switch, you see? Yeah. So there are sometimes there are only three months. So sometimes there are six months and you have new cops in town. So the moment you need, they won't be there. That's exactly too fast. Right. And you can go down and have your phone number registered with the police. And then you dial what one six five is it pound one six five? Um, I don't know. I'm not in that system. But there's sorry. a there's a phone number that you dial. It's like pound one six five, and that automatically should dispatch the police supposedly. Correct. Um, I don't know where we are. We don't use it because they're just not going to come up here. Yeah, you need your own. Uh, We've got our own security. Yes. Our own police department. Okay, so um, let's see. Is it possible to find an Instapot in Ecuador? Um, I don't have one, but I know they are now available here. I've seen them. Um, when we first moved here, people started talking about Instapots. I didn't know what they were, and people were bringing them from the U.S. But now they are available here. That may be one of those things you want to bring yourself. It'd probably be cheaper to bring it from Amazon here than it would be to buy one here, but I know they sell them here. I've seen them. Okay, somebody wanted to know how many acres on our little farm here. We're two and a half acres. We're one hectare. Uh, we first started farming. My first farm was over 150. And then uh, over the years, I've kind of been making my farm smaller and smaller with the idea of that this is kind of like an urban farm and that we want to grow enough for our family and enough to give away. So uh, we don't need any more than what we've got. This is all we can take care of. The only thing I would want more land for would be maybe to raise some sheep, which I don't want to do. Someone asked how many animals we have on the property. You know, I got a dozen rabbits at any given time, and we've got a dozen chickens. And, of course, our dogs and the security team, as I call them. 
Okay, so I mentioned tractor supply and our chicken video and I got some responses. This person um, wanted to know more about our rabbits um, and uh, also wanted to know about the banking system. So we're gonna talk about the rabbits. Uh, I bought rabbits here from one of the professors at the University in Loha and they're New Zealand white Flemish giant crosses and we do sell some breeding stock occasionally. Um, but there's all kinds of rabbits available here over in Peru are where the really good um, Flemish giant rabbit clubs are. And so I wanna to go to Peru and pick up some new stock over there. It's been my plan for a while, just haven't done it. But yeah, and so we breed the rabbits specifically for a protein source. And um, yeah, that's right. We butcher them, put them in the freezer. We do sell a few. We're not in the business of trying to sell rabbit meat, but if somebody wants one, we'll do it. Um, that's the way it is. Okay, the Ecuador banking system. I, I need to do a whole video on this, but I'm just gonna cap it real quick. Um, I can't find anybody who will sit down in front of the camera with me to talk about this. So Santi and I are gonna do the best job we can. Here's the way it works here. Um, there are credit unions and there are banks. The credit unions are called cooperativas. And so the banking system here, I bank with Banco de Loja, which is a tier one bank. So it's an international bank, uh, rated very high, AAA, I believe it is. And so um, any bank here in Ecuador, you're only, your money's only insured for up to $32,000. Um, so you need to have several banks. Banco de Pachincha, you know, some of these bigger banks here are Guayaquil, great banks to deal with. Prado Banco. Prado Banco. Um, Bolivariano. Yeah. Those are big banks. In terms of the cooperativas or the credit unions, I bank at JEP, um, I um, Cockpay, um, because they're both two of the oldest, biggest credit unions here. They're pretty darn secure. Some of these new credit unions that come along, they're offering 11, 12%. Stay away from them, you're gonna lose your money. Um, they will go out of business and leave you hanging. Yes, you can get $32,000 back, but it's a process from what I understand, and it's not gonna happen quickly. Um, so having your money spread out is a great idea. So um, can you send money from the U.S. down here? Yes, you can do wire transfers. We write a check from our U.S. bank and deposit it in our bank account here. Five to seven days, the money's in there. It's way cheaper than a wire transfer. Um, JEP Credit Union, I've got a CD there. We had someone recently go to try to open up an account there and JEP would not open their account. They would only open it on a temporary basis until they got their cedula, which is the national ID. So I didn't like that idea. JEP did not do that to us when we came, but they evidently have changed their rules. At Banco de Loja, I took the same person in there. 20 minutes later, they have an account. They got a ATM card and we open up savings accounts here, not checking. Only people that have checking accounts, pretty much businesses. With their passports. Huh? Yeah, but we passport. open it with the passport. With the passport. So no you don't even that. have to be a resident here. You can open up a bank account. That, that could change, but right now that's the case. Yeah, at least you need to, you need to stamp in your passport from when you entered the Ecuador. Yeah, yeah. You're, they they want to see the page that has that stamp. So, um, <clears throat> yeah. It's simple, um, I mean, we can help you do that. Lots of people can help you open up an account. Um, you do need someone to refer you. So like at Banco de Loja, they're gonna want you to have a reference from somebody who has an account there. So this person I just helped, I walked in there with him, the guy knows me, he went, oh, okay, you're referring this person, great. That's the end of it. Be careful, some people will put themselves down as a beneficiary and you wanna make sure that does not happen. So uh, you need to be able to read enough Spanish to where it says the word is beneficiario. Correct. Yeah. So you want to be able to see that, that there's nobody's name in there, but the person you'd like to see yeah. in there. Or avoid so, the sharing account. Yes. You see your name, it's fine. Mm -mm. That's right. So, um, you know, I think our savings account pays 3% or 4%, something like that. And then our CDs are paying 8%. So yeah, it's a good investment. It's, it's a great place to be. You can have your social security checks deposited straight into a bank here in Ecuador. There's two different banks. I know Banco de Pachincha is one of them. And I'm not sure the other bank off the top of my head. Reach out to me, I'll email it to you. 
The Social Security Administration office that takes care of this region is in Santo Domingo. And so that's who you really need to ask questions from. And I have that contact email. Um, and they will tell you the specifics for what they need. And they will deposit your check here. I'm still having mine deposited in the U.S. And again, I just write a check and deposit it here. So it works. I, I am going to have my Social Security eventually deposit directly here in the e Ecuador bank. Um, need to go to Banco de Pachincha. You'll have to go help me set that one up. And so I, I'm going to get an account there and have it deposited directly. Um, when Lisa gets ready for Social Security, she'll do the same. So, um, yes, that, that can happen here. It's not that big a deal. Yep. Okay, somebody asked, are you both working 24-7 every day? Um, no, we are not. We are retired. Um, I, the Work is a four-letter word. I try not to use that word. <laughs> um, we we work hard on our videos, yeah, and Lisa works hard two days a week baking. Um, but yeah, we try not to work very hard. We do have some part-time employees here who do some gardening work for us. Um, occasionally it's part-time temporary. And uh, you know, that price of that's kind of gone up. We're paying those guys 25 bucks a day now for that. Um, it used to be 20, but you know, the Ecuadorian monthly wage increased and we just felt like it was time for us to pay more. And we also give them food and things. Um, so they work a couple days a week and, you know, those guys, we change them in and out. Um, again, you need to hire people like that who are trustworthy, who come well recommended. And uh, we can help you with that a little bit. Okay. Um, Let's see. Uh, that was everything, man. I think we covered all of those questions. Wow. Cool, cool. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I just want to mention very quick something about uh, going back to the JEP cooperative for the CDs. Um, to get 8%, you, you need a minimum of a year. In some other place, it will be minimum a year and a half, two years. If not, you are getting less than 8%. And something else is when you want to when you want to stop your CD, your investment, you actually need one month before it expires, send them a letter or go there and tell them tell them I want to stop it. If not, if not, it's going to automatically renew and you can't do anything about it. You have to wait again another year or two years. Or you can, but it costs like $150, I think. Um, oh, yeah, you're going to have a fee. Yeah, if, you can if, stop if, your CD at any point, but there's a fee for doing it. Yes, yeah. it depends the bank. Yeah, it's, it depends the bank, yeah. Yes, yeah, some of them, they have a big fee for it. Some of them are going to give you a lot of trouble to stop the CD and yeah. give your money back. So be sure you, you know Notify them when and... you're going to stop your CD. And when, when it expires, you need to be ready. A My month. CDs are, are two-year CDs. I, I, I just do that because I want the most interest I can get. Um, they don't have to be. You can do a six-month CD. And also, I mean, if you're going to put $1,000 in a CD, you're probably not going to get the top yeah. rate. You're probably yeah. going to get six. Um, or less. Or less, yeah. So you need to, you know, maybe 10000 and up is where you need to be. I... I wouldn't do a CD myself for less than twenty thousand. Um, I think that's kind of the minimum they really want to give you yeah, good correct. good interest rate for. So yeah, um, we bank here. We have online banking with Bank of Aloha, and what happens here a lot, and don't be shocked by this, is people will say, "I'm going to give you my banking information, and you can transfer the money to, to me." So don't be shocked by that. If you're going to make a large purchase, that's how we do it here. We we um, just get online and transfer the money. Like if I want to give Santiago $5,000, I would go online and transfer the money to his account, wherever his bank is. And you kind of have to get used to that process. Don't be concerned. Somebody's asking for your account information to, to send you money. We do that a lot here. And the first time I heard that, I was like real suspicious. But that's just how it's done. And yes. we did learn something too, like Banco de Loja, you cannot pull out more than $30,000 in a month and you have to go down to Banco de Loja in person, right? 
and to be able to, to pull out any more than that. It's actually you transfer. You can transfer more than thirty thousand dollars from your computer. You have to go there and sign some papers and make the order if you want to transfer more than thirty thousand dollars. Yeah. So if you're going to put a hundred thousand in, and they also have some rules about what time of day you can withdraw large sums of cash, um, like. Past two o'clock in the afternoon, they're not going to give you large sums of cash. Correct. Um, I remember I ran into that, and because of an eye surgery I was going to have done, and uh, I begged them, said, "Look, I got to have this surgery first thing in the morning, so I need that, you know, twenty five hundred dollars cash." And so they finally gave up and gave it to me. But just just understand, in yeah. the mornings before noon is the best time to go do your bank. Exactly. Some banks twelve o'clock, some banks one o'clock, two o'clock. So depends. Depends what bank. It's just different here. It's different than wherever you live. So um, you just have to learn these little ins and outs. We'll try to help you, you know, with rules can change. Yes. You know? And pulling money out of ATM is, for example, my bank lets me take $500 a day. Some other banks will be $300, $400. Yes. Minor 300 yeah. Now, if I use another ATM that's not from my bank, it only allows me to take two hundred dollars, and in two steps, one hundred and one hundred. Now, I think with Bank of Aloha, I can take three hundred out twice in one day, so I could take actually up to six hundred. That's cool. But I have to do it through two different ATMs, or hmm. my card and then Lisa's card. We've done that before. So, and. <clears throat> I would say get in the habit of not keeping cash in your house and um, using your ATM card. If you have to go pay somebody, go to the ATM, draw the money out, and then pay whoever you have to pay. Um, now, if you live in Vilcamba and and uh, weekends or you have a whole day, make sure you pull out the money a few days before because if you're right, if you are going to the ATM, there are actually four ATMs in Vilcamba. Guayaquil, Austro, Jep, and Banco Aloha. Yeah. And those four ATMs will be empty in the middle of a whole day or maybe the Sunday. Uh, Especially during Carnival. No more money. Yeah, they'll oh, be yeah. out Carnival, of money. Carnival, first day, no money anymore. Yeah. All right. Well, I think we've covered a bunch on this Q&A. If you have more questions, send them on. We'll do a part two at some point. All right, appreciate you watching, and thanks for all the thumbs up and subscribes. Ciao for now.